so thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I come from City University of London. Uh, and the work I'm going to be talking about here uh, was done um, at City Health Research Center um, over the last two years. Um, we looked at uh, social media, in particular Twitter, around the swine flu pandemic in 2009. And we looked at how the social media could be used for predicting outbreaks or understanding upcoming spike of the disease. And we also looked at the um, combination of social media and online media coverage of medical uh, events and public health events. Well, as you know, healthcare in the 21st century has gone mobile. And a surprisingly high number of users, 17% in the last year uh, P Institute study in the US, are using their mobile devices to look up health information. So it's no longer just the internet, it's the mobile, always on, always on demand, access to medical information wherever we are. The second major phenomena which is influencing medical information in the cybersphere is online coverage. Media are increasingly in interested in covering any details of public health emergencies, predicting emergencies, celebrities having got diseases, and public are obviously bombarded with this kind of coverage. And professionals in public health and computer scientists need to work together to be able to communicate quality evidence-based information to public in a real time to overcome often bias. So in our study, which was set up by a colleague of mine uh, at DeKinsey, who is now at the University of Greenwich, we have started uh, searching the world flu and influenza uh, at the beginning of May 2009. And the study was running as a longitudinal study of collecting uh, tweets uh, until the winter or the spring of 2010. And then uh, the final analysis I will be uh, presenting here was conducted by another colleague of mine, uh, Martin Shomshor, and a colleague of mine from journalism, Connie St. Louis. How many tweets do you think we have collected over the period containing the world flu influenza? It was only in English, so there was a bias towards English language. What is your guess? It was before Twitter kind of hit mainstream, so it was only, only three million. At the time, we thought it was quite a massive sample. So what we did, we looked at um, how links present in the majority of the tweets have been actually um, represented, how many resources were being linked to, whether they are medical, whether they are blogs. And we also work with our journalists, science journalists, to categorize and evaluate quantitatively what kind of resources users on Twitter have been linking to and propagating through the network. We also look at people we called self-reporting users, people who felt they had the disease. It doesn't mean they actually had the disease because we would obviously be lacking a lab-confirmed case of their, um, of, their, um, of their case, but we actually look at people who did say one of the sentences, I have flu or I have the, the, I have the flu. And we received in total almost 25,000 users mentioning one of these two sentences. It was a pilot study, but the signal was so strong that even re restricting it to a very basic expression, not using any semantic relationship between symptoms and the disease, we actually got a very interesting signal. And you can say the signal has been um, broken down to US and UK users over this period, and the self-reporting flu tweets have actually generated a signal which has been in the UK and in the US following the official surveillance data. Interestingly enough, in the UK, and this is a comparison with the Royal College of GPs in the UK, providing week-by-week uh, -week, uh, surveillance data from GP surgeries, which are sort of passed on to the HPA and reported through the HPA website, we have been able to pre predict an upcoming spike in the spring of the uh, swine flu pandemic 2009, about a week before the official surveillance data. And also bear in mind that the official surveillance data come to the HPA and they often actually put on the website a week after because they need time to collect it from the local, regional and national level. So in reality, up to two weeks, we were able to predict 
the upcoming big spike in the spring. And also there was a smaller spike, which actually in reality was perhaps bigger, but because of the introduction of the NHS flu line, people didn't go to see a, G uh, a GP as much as they did at the beginning. So both spring and the autumn spikes were monitored. Another interesting question was, in addition to being able to predict the disease, was looking at what is the relationship between media and the social media discussion. Is it the media influencing Twitter? People read about it in the news and then they start tweeting about it. Or is it the actual phenomena? Is it the swine flu being discussed over the media? People sharing their concerns, their panic, their symptoms, which is driving the media interest. So we looked at it by plotting um, the the sample of the tweets we collected and um, articles from Google News over this period. And we haven't actually found any major causality. So it wasn't the Twitter predicting or being before the media coverage. It wasn't the media coverage pre pre prevent predicting the actual Twitter. It was mostly happening uh, on both kinds of media on the same day. In some cases, there were more discussion on Twitter, in some cases, more discussion in the news, but actually the, the time correlation hasn't been observed on this case. And the final study we looked at was looking particularly specifically on one important day in the pandemic. It was the 11th of June 09. Do you remember what happened on the 11th of June 09? It was the biggest sort of media, um, media covered event. WHO declared a swine pandemic um, stage six. So it was declared as the highest stage of pandemic. There has been discussions about whether this was right or not. But however, this was a major event, major event for public health around the globe. And it was obviously a major event from Twitter and also for media coverage. We looked at how Twitter responded to this declaration by WHO. We looked at by uh, looking at tweets 24 hours after this official announcement and a press release by WHO and investigating at what tweets have been linking to a media discussion and media coverage of this particular event. So we look at the tweets and you can see each hour is plotted kind of in a t as a time frame. And uh, we look at which media have arrived on Twitter the first and how popular they, they were in terms of being tweeted and retweeted through the social network. So you can say, you know, for three hours it was just um, the WHO and then um, CNN were the first retweeted through Twitter and after CNN there was um, USAT and after this BBC came on board. The BBC was definitely the most popular media which were tweeted immediately after it arrived and then stayed the top link on Twitter basically until the end of the day. So obviously it is a small case study. It was a very specific event which drew a lot of attention by public and media. But it seemed like the BBC have basically over, overrun not just uh, CNN and other channels which has, has been on the network before, but also by a magnitude overrun WHO, CNN, uh, sorry, CDC and ECDC, the European Center, doesn't even make it to Twitter at all. So for public sort of risk communication, it is important to understand that putting information on government and agencies' website doesn't necessarily create the right bus and spreads as fast as communicating it through high quality agencies like BBC. The work has received a lot of media coverage. There has been a BMJ panel and a sort of scientific movie done about this research afterwards. And there also has been a, a, a feature at BMJ published two months ago covering this particular research, if you're interested. And in particular, I'd like to thank you to Martin Shomshor and Connie San Luis, and previously at Kinsey, who done a lot of work on this uh, interesting study. So thank you. Any questions? outlets that are spread out throughout the 24 that. hours yeah and and so how do you normalize that or, or is the hour of the day even meaningful at that at that point or are you just looking for the net, net we we were not looking for for uh, because it was it was round the globe we were just looking for basically since the official announcement what was the the reaction by 
the social media for 24 hours afterwards. And nowadays all media are global 24 hour anyway, so it, is, it will be interesting to look into specifically where the retweets of those links happen to appear, was it the US, was it the UK, where in terms of the actual day hours these have been happening, but the media have been covering it all 24 hours. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.